Now to kick off this session, um, I wanted, we wanted to sort of ground us a little bit in the reality, the lived experience of the pandemic. And I'm hoping Annie Bocock is ready to share some thoughts from uh, her experience as a, as a young person living through this extraordinary uh, two years, which has really transformed what being, being a young person is uh, right across the world. So Annie, are you ready to speak to Absolutely, us? Absolutely, yeah, I am. Um, oh, so you are. Thank you, Jeff, um, for that. Um, so yes, I'm Annie, I'm from a group called the Future Voices Group, um, which is a collection of around kind of 15 um, young people from across the UK um, who has kind of faced some barriers to employment um, in their own time and experiences. Um, kind of being on earth I guess um, it's kind of a part of a small like a larger organization got a youth futures foundation um, who were given um, 90 million from the reclaim fund to, to kind of tackle um, issues of um, youth unemployment um, especially those in the most kind of disadvantaged um, kind of across the UK um, so the group we've kind of focused on collecting evidence um and kind of igniting change across the sector um, and also investing in kind of um smaller organizations on the ground that are doing a lot to kind of um, tackle some of these barriers um personally um so i have kind of had experience being neat so not in employment educational training um after dropping out of university when i was around 20 um years old um currently i managed to return <laughs> to education um so i currently i'm in my first year at the university of leeds studying international development um so yeah i have a variety of kind of different experiences um a lot of kind of my family members have been neat um at different points of their life um, and had various issues kind of getting into employment and stuff like that um this is only kind of exasperated um during the pandemic as I'm sure you're all aware, um, young people kind of have arguably been hit most by the pandemic in terms of employment, with a lot of kind of youth heavy markets kind of closing, um, for example, kind of retail and catering, um, kind of hospitality and stuff like that. Uh, on top of that, um, graduate schemes, apprenticeships, internships, etc., were cut off for many young people um, after <laughs> they had to kind of secured them um a lot of them kind of got emails or phone calls just being like we can't actually support you now that this pandemic has come on um so i'm sure two years ago that was quite a shock to a lot of young people that were kind of um yeah had to go through that um it left a lot of young people financially insecure as well um and we can see now that whilst we're getting on kind of out of the pandemic um a lot of these kind of issues still are in place. We're seeing maybe that a lot of young people are struggling to get back into work um, due to different issues. Um, and of course, the effect on education over the past two years may cause a lot of issues further down the line, um, some five years time, where whether young people will be ready for work um, and stuff like that, um, not only in the academic sense, but also, kind of um socially um and kind of yeah practically whether they'll be ready for that um so personally um during kind of the pandemic i mean like i wouldn't say i had it necessarily easy um i was on furlough um so during the last two years before i started university um again i was in retail um so obviously we were on furlough um for that number of time um, it did leave me feeling quite isolated from other people. Um, basically, as I'm sure we all did, we basically just kind of stayed with family. Um, and I think at a time where I was starting to connect with my colleagues a lot more, um, that was kind of taken away from me um, when we kind of, yeah, had that um, kind of, yeah, period of isolation. Um, just closed it shut down um and i think returning back to work 
um, there was a lot of kind of issues with shift availability and stuff. Um, at the time, I was saving back up um, for tuition fees to join um, university again. So I had a kind of pressure to be able to not only kind of afford to live, um, but to kind of save up some money as well um, for my own education. Well, I think all in all, it was kind of a nice opportunity as well to kind of get back in touch with some skill sets and um, volunteer and um, stuff like that. And I think that is kind of, um, I don't know, a nice takeaway from the pandemic that should continue for a lot of people, just the space to be able to um, kind of gain new skills in their own time, volunteer and do what they want to do um, and kind of leave some time to rejuvenate so that young people start to feel kind of less burnt out and stuff like that um so yeah as kind of vacancies are picking back up again um across the sector we see it in the care sector um retail to an extent but also green jobs and the kind of um pick up and marketing campaigns that have been made for that um over the past kind of six months or so um we need to kind of find ways to get young people into meaningful employment um which is a big kind of branch of what we do it's not about just getting into a job necessarily that young people are passionate about um it's about getting them into kind of meaningful employment where they can develop their own skills um, and interests and actually give value um to an organization um, we've seen that a little bit with kickstart um, and aspects of levering leveling up sorry um as well as kind of the introduction of youth hubs um but as i'm sure <laughs> you're all aware there kind of needs to be mass um transformation across the sector to be able to do that um i think that is me thank you very much annie that's that's a very helpful sort of grounding and, and as you say there are there have been some positives <laughs> from the pandemic and we will try and uh focus on those but also a lot of negatives uh, of young people missing out on school or university uh, or uh, apprenticeships. And at the early stage of the pandemic, almost a collapse of jobs for young people. It, as you say, it has got a bit better uh, more recently, but there's lots of evidence how that has long-term scarring effects. Your experiences early on have a big impact uh, on the future. And that slightly invisible set of uh, impacts on young people, we're very keen, we keep in focus uh, as we think about what should be done next. You mentioned leveling, you mentioned leveling up. Our next speaker is the, the guru of leveling up, Andy Haldane, uh, boss of the RSA and also the permanent secretary in charge of uh, leveling up across government and author of the recent uh, government paper uh, on that. So Andy, a very warm welcome to you. And uh, please share with us your thoughts on uh, on how levelling up the pandemic and recovery connect together. Well, Jeff, thank you very much for that um, that kind warm introduction. And morning, uh, everyone. Delighted to be at this uh, great and indeed very timely event on this set of issues. I thought I'd just offer a few uh, reflections on well, both the the challenges that UK PLC has felt uh, over the last two years uh, in the light of COVID. But I thought equally important to, to mention some of the opportunities that have been thrown up by that. I mean, Jeff mentioned the point about uh, all crises offering plenty of both challenge and opportunity. I think particularly at this moment, uh, where it's really easy uh, to see what might go wrong, it's important not to lose sight of what could prospectively go right uh, if we play our cards right and not to catastrophize uh, where we might be. So I thought I'd start actually with some of the places where new opportunities have sprung up in the light of COVID and then to finish uh, with some challenges and then perhaps in the conversation we'll get on a bit to, to how to minimize the challenges and to maximize the opportunities that COVID has undoubtedly like previous crises thrown up. So five uh, opportunities. Um, the first, I mean, I think we'd all agree that one of the great success stories uh, of the past two years has been the vaccine program, um, which begged the, uh, the obvious question, why was it 
uh, that was such a success. Uh, success, of course, has many parents. But for me, a crucial ingredient was the, you might call it, model of industrial organization that was used to deliver, to take us uh, from the lab uh, to the, the vaccination center. That involved uh, a very explicit uh, joining of hands between uh, the public sector, the private sector, uh, and civil society, acting in partnership, acting in uni unison at all stages of the supply chain, from lab uh, right through uh, to vaccines in arms. Uh, this, in fact, is not a new model of industrial organization. It's the self-same model that has delivered success at least since the Industrial Revolution. We rediscovered it in a crisis context uh, with COVID, and it showed once again to be the recipe for getting things done at speed and at scale, harnessing the very best of all three uh, of the sectors acting together. Not a pure market model, not a pure state model, but rather a blended mix uh, of the two with civil society playing a crucial glue role on top of that. I hope that's a model of industrial organization that we can use uh, in uh, peacetime as well as wartime outside of the crisis period, because therein, for me, lies the secret source uh, to success, point one. Point two, um, uh, the catastrophic falls in levels of activity uh, that came from the various uh, restrictions and accompanying behaviors uh, did not uh, cause anything like the damage to jobs and to incomes that were feared uh, at the very start uh, of the crisis. Or put differently, the various intervention programs, support programs put in place both locally here in the UK and globally, proved to be far, far more successful than I think almost everyone uh, expected. To such an extent uh, that in many countries, certainly in the UK, unemployment is already uh, back to pre-pandemic uh, levels. The hit to incomes has been nothing like as great as that which you typically associate with the shift uh, in uh, GDP. In fact, in employment terms, we now find ourselves uh, with the highest level of unfilled vacancies uh, in history and, and, and acute skill shortages uh, that are very broadly based. I'll come back to that point in a second. Third um, opportunity seized to some extent was that of necessity, both businesses and individuals were forced to lean actively in to the digital revolution to transform how they did business and to transform how they did uh, their daily uh, work. It required a nudge of business, particularly business laggards, uh, to get their digital house in order. And it needed a nudge to, a great, to cause a great uh, number of individuals uh, to fine tune and improve uh, their digital skills. That has delivered, I think, benefits both of a productivity nature to both businesses uh, and to individuals, and indeed broader benefits that, than that in terms of flexibility of business models, flexibility of working practices, and accompanying boosts to levels of reported satisfaction uh, in the workplace. My fourth uh, and it flows a bit from that um, because the benefits of this increased digital connectivity haven't just flow uh, throw, um, arisen for, for people, to businesses and to workers, but also to places. Uh, because uh, physical proximity has suddenly become uh, a bit less of a constraint on where business is done and where workers work. And that means places that were previous distant satellites uh, of agglomerative cities have suddenly 
become within their orbit, and indeed some stranded uh, towns and villages that were seen to be beyond any city planet's orbit have now uh, been brought within range. And those are things that are really positive from a broadly speaking uh, leveling uh, up uh, perspective. Final positive before I turn to some of the challenges more briefly uh, would be uh, around the rather more intangible uh, of the capitals, that is to say, uh, social capital, an issue in which Jeff is, of course, uh, a real global expert. Of all the capitals that collapsed during COVID, social capital was the one that stood uh, tall. We saw that uh, in the great boom in volunteering, including to the NHS, uh, the proliferation of community action groups uh, of various types, and more generally, uh, a reawakening uh, of the true power of friends, families, communities, uh, and uh, charities. Now, all of those prospectively, prospectively, are fantastic endowments, fantastic legacies. And the question now is not to let those legacies on endowments deplete, indeed to build uh, upon them, which takes me uh, to the accompanying five challenges uh, to sit alongside those five opportunities, some of which already been touched upon, so I can be much briefer. I mean, the first of those, and most obviously, uh, is uh, that COVID very clearly uh, was not an equal opportunity challenge. It hit hardest, uh, the poorest, uh, and the most vulnerable, uh, whether that is earning uh, and learning, or whether that is health, both physical and mental, as we've heard, not least from Annie uh, just now. Uh, that disproportionate COVID impact, of course, played into what were already large and widening pre-existing uh, disparities uh, in wealth uh, and in health, uh, and to complete the trio and in happiness uh, as well. A bad situation was made somewhat worse. If that is the people-based dimension, there's also an important place-based dimension because hardest hit of the places by COVID were the larger cities. I'm sure Deborah speaking next will have a bit more to say about that, but a significant hollowing out of many of our city centers, not all of that center uh, has been refilled in the period uh, since. Thirdly, uh, and interestingly, and less discussed so far, um, in the pre-COVID period, the prime driver of growth, certainly in the UK, had been increased labour supply. And a good deal of that increased labour supply came courtesy of increased participation in the workforce, not least from women. COVID has reversed those trends. The reason why we have a record level of vacancies in the UK and very pervasive skill shortages is because the UK labour force has lost between half a million and a million people over the course, course of the last uh, couple of years for a variety of reasons, not all of which we properly understand, but certainly which include uh, different lifestyle choices being made by the over 50s, which is where almost all uh, of that increased inactivity uh, has been centred uh, so far. That's one of the reasons the cost of living crisis is being given extra impetus. We are short of people in ways that is bidding up the cost of people through wages. And that brings us to my fourth point, which is another casualty of COVID, has been uh, global supply chains. In fact, this in some ways was another uh, nail uh, in uh, another friction, rupturing, of global supply chains. We had the first uh, with the global uh, financial crisis and COVID has been a second. Um, all of a sudden people have seen the necessity of making uh, at home and have sought in, in some cases to shun international supply chains. That too is increasing the costs of goods and the costs of services and amping up therefore the cost of living. It's not just energy, 
this is goods and services uh, and people uh, as well. And finally, on the challenge side, Jeff, we have had the fact, uh, and Peter just made this point, uh, that many governments uh, have rightly, I think, thrown the fiscal kitchen sink at the COVID crisis that nonetheless has gone further towards exhausting uh, their fiscal uh, space, bidding up very significantly uh, levels of government debt in a ratchet that we all also saw, of course, after the time of the global uh, financial uh, crisis. And begs the big question, um, what is it that turns this ratchet uh, down. If another big risk came along, would there be, as things stand, sufficient fiscal space to play the crucial cushioning role played during the course of COVID? So there we have some of the credits and some of the debits. Both of them uh, are uh, very uh, large. We shouldn't lose sight of both of them. Perhaps in the discussion we can come to how we can tackle those challenges, perhaps by building on some of those endowments that I mentioned earlier on. I have a few reflections myself on how we might do that. But given the time, Jeff, let me, let me pass back to you and perhaps we can pick that up during the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. That was uh, fantastic and very uh, rich agenda to talk about. Uh, we'll pick up, I'm sure, on many of the issues about place uh, from Deborah and Marvin Rees in this session and also at a lunchtime session with city leaders, what has happened to the relationship of big cities, medium-sized cities, towns, places which maybe uh, can connect more into the, the economy than five or 10 years ago. And I hope maybe we can also later pick up one of the other things you mentioned, Andy, which we're doing quite a bit on at IPO, which is the change in the nature of government, how government works. As you say, in the emergency, government here and elsewhere relearned some skills in industrial and technology orchestration, which perhaps had been a bit forgotten, relearned how to do welfare very rapidly uh, on a different scale, uh, relearned all sorts of skills, in, at least in some countries, in using data and knowledge. Uh, will there be lasting effects to non-emergency government? And how well does the UK perform in that respect, perhaps relative to some of the best in the world? Who can we learn from as we retool for the challenges ahead? So hopefully there'll be a bit of time to come back to that. Um, but now if we could turn to Deborah Cadman, uh, Chief Exec of Birmingham, formerly West Midlands Combined Authority, and uh, a member of the IPO Advisory Group. Deborah, I hope you are ready to share some thoughts with us now. I am now on off mute. And hello, everybody. Re really good to be here. And, and Annie, um, everything that you shared with us is, is something that is shared by the young people that we're working with in the city as well. And, and, and what you said really resonated with me. And, and Andy, um, what I'm going to do is take a lot of your national perspective and try and give it a kind of more local flavour. So, so I, I, I just wanted to start by saying that, that Birmingham as, as the the largest um, city outside London did face some of the greatest challenges um, and experienced some of the deepest impacts actually from the pandemic. And, and I know that Marvin will, will kind of um, talk about those those as well. We started that the, we or we went into the pandemic with a significant number of people on low pay and insecure jobs. And what the pandemic did was was demonstrate that those were the least resistant to economic shocks. So, so we saw a disproportionate impact on many of our communities as we entered into the pandemic. And, and what that also meant was that they, they found it very difficult to access some of the financial um, support schemes. You know, furlough wasn't open and accessible to, to everyone. And, you know, when people were living hand to mouth, when there was a lot of uh, self-employed people who just were cut, cut loose uh, and didn't have access to uh, financial support. And we found that was that was a real problem for, for the city. And um, we also found that existing poor health outcomes were exacerbated. Um, and we've got the largest black and Asian uh, population outside London. So when um, events like 
Black Lives Matter happens, it opens, you know, it let the genie out of the bottle. And we have not been able, and neither should we, put that genie back into the bottle. And it highlighted a series of inconvenient truths, I think, for a lot of people, not just in the city, but across the country as well. And what it has made us do is be more thoughtful and more intentional, intentional about how we address some of those um, institutional uh, uh, kind of inequalities that we've seen and continue to see in the city. We also saw a massive rise in mental health issues uh, amongst our young, young people. And it is something that we have not been able to, to address quick enough and uh, deeply enough. And it continues to be a big challenge for us. That's compounded by the fact that 40% of our young people live in poverty. And with the cost of living increases, we expect that to rise significantly. We've also seen a massive um, divide in the educational attainment gap, and we're really struggling to close that gap at, at the moment. And we've lost a lot of our young people. Uh, and what I mean by that is we're still seeing significant numbers of our young people not attending school. We also saw uh, significant increases in the rates of domestic violence for all of those social reasons that I won't, I, I don't need to, to kind of go through in detail. And we also saw an unbearable uh, increase in the levels of our child protection orders during that time. And, and a more Parochial level, uh, public transport patronage fell off as, as, as it did everywhere across the country and we're still struggling to get that patronage back up to pre-COVID levels. So those are all the, the kind of challenges that, that we experienced during the pandemic and we are still seeing some of those challenges now and we're working hard to address them, but I think it's, it's going to take a systemic response rather than just a local authority response. But there were some good stuff, and I, I, I do want to kind of build on some of the, the, the good positive things that Andy spoke about, actually. Um, there was a real appreciation, I think, in green infrastructure, and people began to really value their open spaces. But they also started to question their environment. You know, the fact that they were living in flats with very little open space available to them has made us now rethink the way in which we are going to regenerate and develop our place uh, as a city from, from now on. People also um, ha have conveniently forgotten, I think, the brilliant work that was done around everybody in. So, so as a result of that, the, the numbers of rough sleepers in the city have reduced significantly. Now, they've reduced significantly because we put, we invested in the wraparound care for those people that were taken off the streets and put into warm accommodation. So we didn't just give them a place to lay their heads. We actually worked really hard to talk about raising their skills, to give them the, the, the mental health support they needed, to, to give them a, a sense of future, and then to also give them an opportunity to live in a home. And, and that was paid back in spades. So that was a really positive thing as a result of, uh, of COVID. And then um, we've started to rethink about our city centre. And Andy was absolutely right. The city centres have been hollowed out. But we've been really intentional in the repurposing uh, of our city centre in, in Birmingham. Because there were some things that we were very happy to let go. There were other things that we're working hard across our partnership to ensure that we can replace and rebuild uh, and reframe, if, if you like. And we're seeing lots more footfall in our city centre now, although we have lost lots of retail. Some of it is a good thing, some of it not, not so much. But the challenge for us is repurposing those vacant uh, shop fronts that, that we've got. And then uh, community spirit. I mean, it was phenomenal and continues to be phenomenal, actually. Um, so local, um, local people are continuing to build on that volunteering spirit now. So I think somebody said in the chat box that they are still seeing um, prevalence of food banks. We're seeing those increase now. We are, we are genuinely seeing a massive increase uh, in food banks. Uh, and, and we have more volunteers than we need because people want to retain that sense of civic pride, but also giving back to our communities. 
And we're also building on that for the Volunteers for the Commonwealth Games, which is happening in the city uh, in 128 days. Um, the, the other issue I, I would want to talk about is the digital switch to access and services. And, and Andy spoke about the, the economic side and the business side, but actually as a local authority in the public sector, you know, we switched to digital access and we've kept hold of that and we're building on that. And we, we, we found that that meant that people could access our services better, quicker, more efficiently and cheaper. Uh, and then uh, I'll just give you a, an example of a business that, that, that kind of did that switch. We've got a Michelin star restaurant and Michelin star chef who works incredibly hard to support communities. It's, it's, a, it's an Asian business, it's an Indian restaurant, um, a Fiends, if anybody's particularly interested. Um, Axar switched to delivering home de delivery, but at the same time, he recruited 25 apprenticeships, young people to come in to his business to help him switch to delivering home delivery. The home delivery service is much more profitable for him now than the actual restaurant. So that's a real success story of somebody taking advantage of not only um, uh, pivoting, uh, but also uh, doing good through it as well and, and bringing on young people and giving them the opportunity to, to gain additional skills. So, so there are some real, still some real challenges for us, but, but we're trying to, to use what we learned through the pandemic to inform things like our levelling up plan. And, and I would argue if you haven't, if people haven't read the Birmingham levelling up plan, then do it, because I think it's one of the, the most um, uh, relevant uh, levelling up plans because we're really focused on two things. One, of course, we've got to do, you know, the, the, the investment in infrastructure. Of course, we have builds upon the catalytic impacts of an effect of high speed two coming into the city. But also, we're absolutely clear we've got to level up our communities as well. You cannot have one without the other. And I've been consistent throughout my whole career in being clear on that. If you want strong, sustainable, credible economies, you've got to have strong, sustainable, supportive communities. They are symbiotically linked. So the plan looks at both. We are about building back better. We're also about build, building back stronger, but we're also about building back fairer for our communities as well. What I would say is the response to COVID from the local authority was heroic. And, uh, and that goes across all of our local authorities. It was absolutely heroic. But it did, did expose some frailties. And then one of those frailties was, you know, at the, at the beginning, the inability to work across the system and with uh, central government quick enough and effectively enough. And if you look at the things that worked incredibly well, they worked well because there was a focus on systems leadership rather than individual organisations working on their own. If you look at shielding, it was a disaster. You know, we had Muslim families receiving you know, uh, food parcels with, with pork, it, it, you know, it was just, it was just ridiculous. But when it was then given to the local partners and authorities to deliver, it was much better. Uh, and, and I wrote a, a piece uh, about, you know, the centre cannot hold. And when you have a crisis like that, you can't deal with it from, from Whitehall. And I still, I still believe, believe that. Um, I, I I think I'm probably at the end of my time, but I've got a lot more to say, but, but I did want to finish by talking about the shift that we've got to make from COVID to climate change. And I think one of your previous spoke, uh, speakers was very clear on that. Th this is the new pandemic for us. And, and my anxiety is that, you know, we're, we're, leave, we're going to leave it too late to make the, the changes that we need to make in order to achieve carbon neutrality for our communities. So we're, we're responding to COVID, of course we are, because the impacts will be felt for a long time by many of our communities. But equally, we've got to be focused on what the future holds for our communities and our places. And our response to the climate challenge, I think is the most important thing that we need to address. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Deborah. And we will definitely pick that up. And I'm sure actually Marvin Rees will pick that up as well. We're keen really, to use this day and some of this work to think about some of the, the specific issues you mentioned, rough sleepers. We have a session uh, next week actually on lessons globally around uh, the emergency action on, on rough sleeping and how to take that forward. 
and this question of how to re-engineer our systems of governance so different tiers can collaborate more effectively than has happened at, at times during the, the pandemic is, is going to be very live. Yeah. So we'll do these in a bit when Marvin speaks, but first we're going to hear from Sir David Spiegelhalter, who is the nation's favourite statistician. Uh, in some ways, one of the extraordinary things of the last two years is how visible statistics have been as we've tried to make sense of all the different complex dimensions uh, of the crisis. And uh, David, I hope will sort of help us to, to be clear, what are the facts? You know, what should our interpretation of what happened uh, over the last two years be? And we'll then leave to others to talk about what should be done, what the prescription is. But it's really important we have a, a clear perspective on what the, the true facts are. So, uh, Sir David, I hope you are ready to take the screen. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you. With us. Okay, now can you can you hear me? Okay, Jeff, thank Perfect. you so much for the invitation. I don't think I'm going to give you true facts, whatever they are. I never use the word truth at all, and um, it's great to be here. Uh, I think it's probably good that we're online because I've got a a cracking positive line there just sitting. <laughs> so I won't breathe too hard because I've heard Zoom can be a bit iffy. So, uh, so um, a great, great chance to talk. Now I'm an academic, so I'm going to, I'm going to use slides because I can't possibly just, just talk. Um, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about what the facts are. I'm going to talk about the way they've been communicated because this is something I think that we've all been subject to a barrage and a tsunami of numbers coming at us right from the very beginning through the briefings, through the um, you know, the newspapers and the media and so on. And I've been responsible for, for lots of that. But um, I, I, I think it is, from my professional perspective, that is my real interest of what we can learn from this pandemic about how, what's gone well and what hasn't. In particular, the delivery from, from government. So I'm not going to deal with the media coverage particularly. I'm happy to talk about it. I'm going to talk about the government. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to do, I'm going to actually put up a title for my talk because I thought of something clever, the good, the bad, and the very ugly, which is uh, my, my understanding of all the graphics that we've seen. So, you know, I just want to start off with things. Like, that was yesterday's dashboard. Um, this is the kind of stuff that's been coming up at four o'clock every afternoon and gets reported on the daily number of deaths, hugely mis misunderstood because, of course, it's the number of deaths that have been reported. It's always lower on Sundays and Mondays and so on. Um, but still, for all its problems, uh, this has been a fantastic resource. Um, you know, the enormous amount of work to bring this all this data together from the four different nations in the UK and to present it in a common way and allow it all to be downloaded. There's an API underlying this so that all this data can be automatically pulled into people's own analyses. And my, most of the insights I've got from the pandemic have been from, in a sense, independent analysts who've been taking this data and doing stuff with it. So this is an, a huge achievement. It took a while to set up, a huge achievement. Um, the other big achievement, I would argue, has been in the for the national, that was, that's run by what was Public Health England, now the UK Health Security Agency. The other body, the Office for National Statistics, has, I feel, also been doing a fantastic bit of work. The COVID infection survey, this was last week, it's just come out 10 minutes ago, the new results, um, it's the only way we know, because it was set up and actually doing a representative sample of tens of thousands of people, it's the only way we know what's really going on. This is the envy of the world. We now know that 99% of the people in this country have got antibodies to COVID, 99%. Um, whether that's through vaccination or prior infection, whatever, but 99% have got antibodies. The, the picture on the graph is extraordinary. Um, this is just antibodies in individuals of different ages. And look at, the, look at the, how we learned from that about the waning. You know, the antibodies went up and then came down again at the second half of last year in the older people. This is disastrous. And so we knew, absolutely knew that boosters must get into people incredibly quickly because of that decline in antibodies, which was rendering older people extremely vulnerable. It also shows that in school kids aged eight to 11, half, half the, school, the primary school kids in the whole country got it in three weeks in, in the Omicron way, caught it. Quite extraordinary data, which we would have no idea of this if it had not been for a policy decision to set up a representative survey in April 2020. I have a total co conflict of interest 
because I'm chair of the advisory board of the COVID infection survey. <laughs> so I would say this, wouldn't I? But it really is good. It's expensive. Bloody hell, it's expensive. But never mind, it is continuing in some form. So there are some policy decisions about communication, collection of data, and its public communication that have been extraordinarily effective. Let's look at the bad, the ugly side. We have had some awful stuff. This was from the COVID winter plan in 2nd of December. This is the worst graph I think I've almost ever seen. It's not even clear whether it's on a log scale. It's been knocked up in Excel by some spad somewhere and stuffed up on, on the national website announcing the COVID winter plan, completely incomprehensible. It's not as, that, that was one that uh, was, was at a particularly controversial time when uh, the arguments about it should be locking down is just at the start of the alpha variant. Um, a lot of disputes about this particular graph because of this, um, if you remember, it was leaked to the press just before the briefing. They weren't going to show it, but somebody leaked it internally in number 10 or so, and it had this panicky fourth could be deaths could be 4,000 a day. You notice that, and that everyone reported it could be 4,000. That, that had been that had been changed weeks beforehand. This was an old graph. It was never meant to be published. It was only there because it had been leaked by some somebody within the organization. Um, in fact, the, the, this graph got a lot of punishment. Look at this is these are the scenarios if nothing changed. And, you know, and apart from the uh, Cambridge one, it was deaths going up to about 2000 a day. In fact, after there was lockdown and deaths went up to 1200 a day in January. So these actually they seem completely reasonable scenarios, maybe not the Cambridge one, but the others completely reasonable scenarios as to what might have happened had the lockdown not happened. So because even with lockdown, it went up to 1200 a day. So, you know, the, all this sort of stuff has had a lot of stick, could have been communicated better. But actually, it's good that we saw it. That I don't, I don't even want to mention that as a bit of communication. It's just the most awful thing you've ever seen in your life. Again, cooked up by somebody in a comms unit, presumably in number 10, thought this was a good idea, putting out this nonsense to the public and therefore not do, you know, helping anyone's understanding at all. And I was um, I did a, a thing when I just called the, the, this and other just use of a whole lot of numbers, a whole lot of number theater, pure performance art going on in the briefings, absolutely dire. But things improved a lot, they did improve a lot. So I, just in, that's some good and some terrible examples. In terms of the, the crucial thing though is trust. Uh, everything comes down to trust, not truth. I'm not gonna, I don't use truth, I do use trust. So trust is the crucial thing. Now, and, and whenever you talk about trust, you talk about Honora O'Neill. And I just say, go back and read her wreath lectures, watch her TEDx um, talk in, in Parliament's done TED talks. She does a nine minute TED talk on trust. It's just brilliant. You know, it's got everything in there, trust, jokes, Kant, philosophy of Kant, everything. She's a philosopher. And um, part of her philosophy, and this is, she, she's great at sound bites. She's a real sound bite philosopher. I love them. Um, and she says, we've already heard today about how we want to be trusted. People want to be trusted. We should have trust in, in our organizations. She says that's completely wrong. That's the wrong aim. You should not be aiming to be trusted. That is, you've got it all the wrong way around. You should be aiming to demonstrate trustworthiness. So I've never read it. I'm sure people in the audience have read Kant. I've never read any Kant, but I understand it's something about duty ethics. And she says there's a duty to demonstrate trustworthiness. And this is an immensely powerful, incredibly simple idea that it, the, it's incumbent upon us as the experts and the authorities to be trustworthy. And then people might offer up their trust if we deserve it. Don't demand it. Don't try to manipulate them into trusting us. Just be trustworthy. And so um, this is, she's had a huge influence. The Code of Practice for Statistics, as I said, I'm on the board of these bodies. Um, and uh, this is a pretty dull document, to be honest. I wouldn't recommend it unless you suffer from problems getting to sleep. But, I, but it, the crucial thing is, it's enormously influential at the moment on official statistics. Is this which enables the Office for Statistics Regulation to publicly tell off Boris Johnson for misusing employment statistics in part. Because the crucial thing about um, statistics is they should be trustworthy. That's the number one pillar for UK statistics. And this is, I think, largely Nora O'Neill's influence, trustworthiness. Then there's quality and value. 
TQ, TQV, national statistics are based on TQV, but trustworthiness, number one. No, okay, so what does it mean to be trustworthy? Um, this is a bit of our work. We wrote a, a, a nature commentary and we said sort of five ways, five things you could look for. The first thing is are, the communication. Are you trying to manipulate people, persuade them to do something, or are you genuinely trying to inform them, empower them to make better decisions or understand the decisions that are being made? You know, and many people will say, oh, we're trying to inform people. No, they're not. They're trying to manipulate them into believing or doing a certain thing. Now, sometimes that's quite reasonable. In crises, maybe, you know, maybe you just have to say, you've got to evacuate. I want to persuade you to do it. I want to persuade you to do something. Other. And just be upfront. You should do this. But for most decisions, if we're not going to be totally paternalistic, we should be trying to inform people. And that means being balanced, not a false balance, climate change, yes, no, you know, in, but it, it does say there's winners and losers, positives and negatives. People can understand this. You've got to be upfront about uncertainty. You've got to have humility about how good your evidence is, how good your models are. Actually, can you predict what's going to happen in six months time? No, you can't. So, you know, so you've got to have this humility as an expert. And uh, you should also though be, not have humility about pre-bunking misinformation. Get in there, preempt it, tell people what's wrong. Just tell people what is wrong, that this is people that are manipulating you. So identify the misinformation. So um, an example, just to finish off, of where we tried to put that into practice was when we were advising Jonathan Van Tam back in April, when he was talking about the, the nasty blood clots that the AstraZeneca vaccine was being linked to, especially in younger people. We got some data, we did some modeling, we did some analyses, we produced some graphics. I talked to him in the morning on the phone and, um, and, and we thought, oh yeah, he will chat about this. And then I turned on the television and there he was actually using our slides, actually going through our slides line by line. And I thought, what, what? I wouldn't dare do that. You know, he's doing it to a live audience, you know, mass audience of press and people and public and everything like that. And he dare, tried to go through this, but he didn't just do next slide, please, bam, bam, bam. He took it slowly and steadily. He, you know, he's got this lovely avuncular manner and he treated the audience with respect as intelligent people who wanted to understand. And he didn't try to manipulate them. He just said there are benefits and there are harms from these, this vaccine. Harms are on the right and they get bigger as you get younger, these blood clots. Um, on the left, the benefits in terms of prevention from intensive care, which we judged was roughly equivalent, um, increase hugely as you get older. For me in my 60s, it's a no brainer what the balance is. But look, if you're under 30, look at the balance there. And so then he said, well, so we're, our policy now is not to recommend AstraZeneca for under 30s. And everyone said, yep, fine, thank you. I'm amazing, no complaints, no fuss. This was appeared in all the newspapers the next day, it went around the world, it was stuck up in surgeries and things like that. And it was all based, I think, on just trying to be trustworthy. Uh, we produced versions later, which were a bit clearer about the limitations in the evidence, but actually for TB, that was, that was just fine. Okay, so um, just one final thing, the quote, Soundbite from Anora O'Neill. God, she's great. If you got, if again, if you want to learn, these are the lessons I learn, and I keep on spouting out that I've learned from. That she had said beforehand, but this pandemic has just re-emphasized it for me. We've got to be trustworthy, and that means making information that we should provide. It's got to be accessible. We've got to put it out there, um, and and yeah, so and allow people to download it. You know, the fact that somebody might misuse it tough luck, we take that risk. It's got to be there. It's got to be understandable. We've got to really work and make sure and listen, listen to the first law of communication. Shut up, listen to your audiences. And the other thing is, it's got to be usable. It's got to answer their questions so right across the board. If, even if you think, oh, that's a silly question. No, it's, if people are concerned about something, it has to address that. And this goes to all the you know, different parts of the community. You've got different levels of lack of trust, whatever. You have to go across to everybody, name it at everybody answering their questions. But then for the, there also though, it has to be accessible. Somebody should be able to check your working. You shouldn't expect to be taken on trust. In the end, you have to trust. I trust all the time, you have to. And Nora Neal says, you can't not trust. You can't do your own research as skeptics will claim, which is just nonsense. I can't, I can't do that. I have to trust in the end. So and, uh, accessible, intelligible, usable, accessible, just such a brilliant list that we should ask ourselves every time we communicate to the public about 
complex you know data and, and, and information okay so conclude top quality statistics are essential well i would say that um, but it takes effort it's, it's costly and it takes work but number one trustworthy communication is absolutely vital and i've learned this you know so strongly from this pandemic and i hope that it is a lesson that we do take forward okay so i'm going to stop there um, and crack through there so that was my little rant um and uh yeah i mean it's a bit different from what everyone else has been talking about but i kind of and i could go on about leveling up statistics a lot but i won't do that now so i'll shut up and um happy to take any questions maybe. thank you thank you so much david a model of clear trustworthy communication there i think <laughs> lots of uh, complex material um, perhaps we might come back a bit later. I, I mean, a, a question to you might be following up on the, the ONS, which has been had a very has been very agile through the pandemic. Ten years ago, twelve years ago, it was a pioneer of measuring well-being. Could we imagine in the future the statistics on mental health, well-being, and so on being as complex, sophisticated, almost real time as what we've seen in the last two years? Don't answer that now, but we might come come back to that uh, a bit later after we've heard from. Uh, from Marvin. So Marvin, I hope you're you're ready to share uh, your perceptions with us. Marvin Rees, Mayor of Bristol, where I was on Sunday, uh, and one of the most prominent, I think, city leaders uh, in the UK mm. throughout the pandemic. Um, please share with us your, your thoughts. Thanks very much. Uh, many of the uh, points, you, you're clearly, because I'm a leader of a place, uh, like Deborah and living in a place like Annie will, will, will kind of flow back. So points have been made, so I'll try and work around around those excellent points that have been made so far. Uh, first off, just to, to say right from the beginning, the way we framed our approach to COVID, uh, we made the point with our population early doors that we're not just dealing with the pandemic, a medical uh, virus, but we're going to be dealing with the consequences of the actions we take to tackle the virus as well the loneliness, people in their homes. We met with our schools during the very uh, pre-lockdown, actually, anticipating that there'd be educational inequalities, increased domestic violence, uh, child abuse rates going up, all the kind of the numbers that uh, Deborah put out as well. So we, we made that the fullness of our approach, not just getting caught up in medical analysis. Um, and secondly, we also made clear to the city that in a city of inequalities already, uh, just like all cities, and, and Deborah's put those out as well, that the underlying drivers of inequality were just about to get worse. We we're already trying to tackle inequalities, but I think Andy put this as well in his language, that those who are most marginal or most vulnerable will be hit first and hardest. And then by definition, they'll be least well placed to benefit from any upturn when it comes and most distant from support packages because they're already wounded. I mean, public health has this approach anyway, right? When you look at the life course of health, if you are not supported to overcome an early challenge, and challenges can lead to greater resilience and strength, but they can actually lead to a wounding that leaves you less able to take on the next challenge. And we have to be very aware as a country that actually for many people, they've not been supported uh, or they've not been able to overcome these challenges in a way that has led them to greater strength. It's led them to greater vulnerabilities, individuals and uh, collectives as well. There are three, three other things that we said about the pandemic I'll share with you now. The first was in a really interesting article uh, by Richard Horton in The Lancet. And he said, actually, we're not suffering really from a pandemic, but a syndemic. And he says that the syndemic is, is the result of an interaction between non-communicable diseases uh, and communicable diseases. So non-communicable diseases that cluster around poverty and inequality. And I shared this in one of my state of the cities. And this is a quote from his article. He said, unless governments devise policies and programs to reverse profound disparities, our societies will never be truly COVID secure. Approaching COVID-19 as a syndemic will invite a larger vision, one encompassing education, employment, housing, food, and environment. And so no nothing should be seen as in medical isolation. It's the medical interacting with the social that creates, that creates a space for that additional vulnerability. Just look at underlying health inequalities. Right? and how that's disproportionately amongst uh, the poorest and most vulnerable people. And in that sense, there is something called the common good, because when society closed down by a uh, you know, pandemic, we all uh, pay a price. The second, it, it, was, it was a sobering moment for me. That's not necessarily largely registered, but I just thought 
what a, what a, a point of pause for humanity, right? In our humility, in humbling us, because the natural world asserted its authority over our social world, our political world, our policy world. The, I, I use that phrase, I took that phrase from the great crash of 1929, when it said that the real world asserted its authority over the paper world, uh, you know, speculation. This was something happened. And often we look at crises and we think there must be a clever person somewhere in some room that could decide that this doesn't happen. War, right? Nuclear war. Some we could just decide not to do it. Refugees, we could just decide to be more welcoming and just, you know? Climate change, we could just decide to reduce less carbon if we really uh, done it. I know it's not that simple, but it's often phrased like that. But this was something that no one in a room somewhere could decide to stop. And there's a taste there of climate change, right? The, the blessing was we could get to the end of this because we could do some science. And over a period of time, we build up the antibodies and, you know, we get the vaccine and we know how to cope. But there was a period of time when our, our subservience to the planet was, was put right in front of us. And I said, that is, a, that is a humbling moment, but it's an amazing opportunity to learn. I think the third thing was the importance of cities in this, right? 55% of the world live in cities now. We're gonna be two thirds in, in the coming decades. In the UK, it's about 90%, right? Most people live in cities by definition. So most people being impacted are being impacted in cities. In 2018, I hosted in Bristol, the Global Parliament of Mayors, right? This is that more and more cities are connecting globally because national governments are showing themselves ill-equipped to cope with post-national challenges like climate change and pandemics, right? So we're working together. On our agenda, which is quite interesting, was migration, urban security. The last thing, and I was thinking, why are they talking about this, was pandemics. I was thinking, that's a global south issue. And now you see that cities were already thinking about how do you prepare for pandemics where people live at density and, and, it, and it impacts um, in a different way. But if we want to build resilience, the way we're going to reach more people more quickly is by looking at city systems, right? Now, burn off on that, and I'll wrap it up now. Um, I think the other opportunity, and I, I agree, never waste a good crisis, is that every one of our systems has been tested, and we need to learn what those tests tell us. We, we postponed our local elections. So democracy was tested, you know, our, our polit political process, our education system, kids falling out of ed education, adult social care and the workforce uh, was stretched. The pathway we provide young people from childhood through teenage to adulthood has been disrupted, right? We need to make sure that we are understanding what that is and not think, well, you know, now we've got levels of immunity, we're going back, it, we're post COVID, we're not post COVID. Because we are living in now, we are living with the consequences of the actions we've taken to tackle COVID. And there's been a wounding, a social wounding, a political wounding, a trust wounding, whatever you want. And we have to recognize we're still in it. If we rush on too soon, we'll fail to learn and we'll carry those vulnerabilities into the future. And that will, have, that will be what it means to waste a good crisis. Let me finish uh, within uh, two thoughts just to finish off. One is to go back to something that Deborah said, right? This, I don't think this was just a medical crisis and it's not just a social policy crisis. This is a leadership crisis, right? And one of the things is that we have to take forward is the level of centralization in the country is not equipped to cope with the crises that are coming. Now that doesn't mean that we don't need national government, right? But this means that we have to think about how we lead and the structures that we lead. And if I just leave it here, I think we're working with a post-World War II model of national and global governance that's not a quote to quit with a world in which many of the challenges are post-national. And cities and global networks of cities perhaps offer a vehicle for governance that is better able to cope with post-national challenges than an over-reliance on national governments that talks in terms of borders and discrete barriers and zero-sum self-interest. That's We still need national governments, but we need to open up the landscape of leadership, right? To have this new structure with, with genuine devolution. And genuine devolution doesn't mean national governments working directly with community organizations. That just makes local community organizations accountable to national government, not to the places in which they work, right? So it's an illusion of delusion when that happens. Um, and the second is the importance of community. Again, we're talking about resilience. One of the most profound sources of resilience in Bristol was when a neighbor knocks on a neighbor's door and says, do you need me to get you shopping? I see that you're lonely, right? That's beyond policy, 
right? It's beyond spending, right? But we still need policy and spending. Let's not forget that the everyone in campaign was paid for, right? You don't, enough, everyone's got to get paid. Nothing's cheap. So let's not, let's not get caught. But commun strong communities, and that comes into housing policy, tackling gentrification, is one of the surest uh, means we have of building resilience into our communities in the face of future future shocks that are increasingly likely, right? And, and, and that resilience is about how we hold ourselves together and get fed. But dare I say, that resilience is also in the face of extremist politics, right? That will come on in periods of great uncertainty and try to hoover up disillusioned, uh, confused and scared uh, people uh, in some QAnon-esque uh, anti-vaxxer world and, and, and leave, leave us with, with that kind of, uh, leave us with a very unsavory uh, future. So I, I think, my, I says my, my, my key thing is we must not start talking as though we are post, post COVID pandemic. We are still in it right now and the consequences of it. Brilliant, thank you so much, Marvin. And that, I mean, that final point about the potential in the next few years for new stresses, living standards falling, people turning to uh, more authoritarian, more xenophobic, more uh, intolerant politics uh, must be something to keep in mind. I'm keen in our final 10 minutes, we can pick up on some of the points you raised about resilience as well as scarring and about the syndemic, you know, what are the actions which could be taken now, which are more holistic, which would look at the interconnections between, uh, between things. And we're also I mean, very keen on this question of was the new settlement in governance, which perhaps the UK needs. Uh, as IPO, we have partners, part of us in, in, uh, in Scotland, in Northern Ireland and Wales, are very conscious of uh, the UK needing new ways of uh, uh, coordinating the different tiers of government. Um, so I'd like to maybe ask each of our speakers to answer any of the things they want, but perhaps particularly what might be some of, if you had to really prioritize one or two more strategic syndemic oriented actions in the next year or two, what, what would they be? Um, so Andy, perhaps we could start with you and you know a wish list to the extent you can. I know you're a civil servant, so you are somewhat constrained, uh, but uh, share with us uh, a couple of thoughts and maybe a bit minutes each if that's okay, Andy. Thank you, Jeff. And I'm going to build actually on what's already been said, I think, by all the speakers. Uh, Marvin just used the language which I really liked, opening up the landscape of leadership. That's almost certainly an expression I'll, I'll rip off Marvin with attribution. Uh, I think that's exactly what we need. Um, in the levelling at white paper that Jeff mentioned at the beginning, we made, I think, a significant stride forward on broadly defined uh, devolution. But I'd be the first to accept uh, that we're still a long way short of where we need to be when it comes to empowering and enabling uh, local leaders. Um, and that means not just conferring uh, greater powers uh, to spend money, but accompanying that uh, greater powers uh, to raise taxes, to finance uh, that spending. There's a natural symbiosis between those two things, because if all you give is the power to spend, uh, then that, that stunts um, uh, incentives to spend that money as wisely as you might. And ultimately what squares that circle is if someone is asking uh, to do more in that local place to say that's absolutely fine, uh, you raise the taxes locally to justify that uh, and justify that to your local electorate. So I'd say on all matters, decentralization and Devo, we are moving in the right trajectory, but we're still a long way short of where we would uh, need uh, to be. And it's not just about Devo as conventionally thought of and defined, be that to a local uh, mayor or some such. I think we need to go down what's sometimes called the, the double devolution route as well, which is empowering and enabling uh, very local communities to uh, take control of their own destiny uh, and to give to them the monies to enable them to uh, make use of those, uh, make use of those uh, powers. Um, I think it, to link together two points, if we are in the game, and we surely must be, of 
having a joined up story to tell about the different arms of policy, uh, health and education and transport and business and local government, um, that will never successfully take place at the central government national level. That has to take place at the local or in some cases, hyper-local community level. So whether it's Devo as conventionally defined or D double Devo at the level of the hyper-local community, uh, those for me would, too, would be two of the essential ingredients on making good of everything that everyone's been describing this morning. I'll stop there, Jeff, thanks. Great, thanks. So I'm glad you mentioned double Devo. I think I coined that phrase about 15 years ago and it sort of went out of fashion for a bit, but the hyper-local has been so important actually in the last two years through the pandemic, it's, it's, it's come back into, uh, into view. And this, the point about money, is also relevant. Where I live in Luton has lost 100 million in the last 10 years. It's quite hard to, do. I mean, devolution without cash and tax powers can be a bit meaningless. Um, Deborah, over to you. So, so a couple of things for me. I mean, what, what I would say is, is Birmingham at the moment is really hot in terms of in, uh, attracting inward investment and uh, global investment particularly. And, and I've been absolutely clear with, with my political leadership that, that if, if people want to come and invest in this city, you don't just do one and done about making profit. You, you actually invest with us in the long term to address some of the big challenges. Because, you, you know, and I've, and I've had an email this morning from a company that wants to, wants to invest, but they're, they're not terribly happy about the levels of homeless and, and you know, drug dealing that's happening down the street and could we just do something about that now and, and we're kind of saying look if you want to invest in this city and, and earn a profit for your shareholders actually you've got to help us address some of the big challenges as well you can't have one without the other and interestingly none of those investors have walked away uh, on that basis so so there's a really interesting dynamic happening i think around investment uh, in, in communities just as well as, as our local economies as well. And I think that's really important for a city like Birmingham. I mentioned our levelling up plan, um, and, I, and I, you know, I, I make no apologies for, for promoting that as a, as a really good plan about what we need to do in order to level up both our economies and our communities. But the most important bit of that is that we can't lose sight of the need to address some of those systemic inequalities that we're seeing across, across our city. Uh, and we will work relentlessly to make sure that we compensate for those uh, and we work with our communities in, in a different way. Um, I, I did, I did uh, write a, a, an article um, in the, uh, a reform document, and Andy, you, you were part of that, where you talk about, you talked about um, the social sector being the kind of society's institutional immune system. And, and I absolutely uh, agree with, with that. And, you know, the role of, of local governments, the role of local institutions, I think, has become more and more important and will become more important in dealing with some of the big global issues that are felt at a local level, like, you know, God forbid we see another pandemic, but, but more immediate is that climate change. And, and the Climate Change Committee came to visit Birmingham uh, recently, and they were absolutely clear, the start of that revolution will happen at a local level. It won't, it won't be able to be done at a national level. Of course, national dis policy decisions about nuclear and everything else are important, but actually the local response to that global challenge is absolutely vitally important, and we will continue to do that. Thanks, Deborah. Um, David, a couple of minutes from you uh, in response, whatever you want to respond to. Oh, um, yeah, I, 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 uh, I, could, I could actually talk a little bit about, we've been talking about levelling up and the, and the, the importance of the, the variation in people's experiences. And I think this is something <laughs> we statisticians have learned enormously over this pandemic is that, you know, just talking about averages is mm. utterly limited. It's like the Brexit thing about, you know, that's, not, that's your GDP, it's not our GDP. Mm. And that has really come over in COVID because as we've heard again and again, the, the range, talking about average experience is deeply limited. Um, 
and, and the average risk of COVID or whatever, because there's a huge variation with old people having 10,000 times the risk of a young person um, with um, you know, the, the, some people infecting huge numbers of people, most people don't affect anyone at all, and so on. You know, the, just talking about averages can be deeply limited. And, um, and I think that's, you know, the, the statisticians have realized this, and ONS, I would say, have realized it, again, they, you know, in terms of moving towards regional GDP, in terms of trying to target the statistics that are relevant to more smaller and smaller communities and making those available is absolutely crucial part of communication now i think it's actually almost insulting just to talk about the average anxiety in the country or the average something that although that is useful as you said the well-being statistics i'm glad ons started collecting them years ago because otherwise we'd never we wouldn't know that we've never been so anxious <laughs> at least uh, <laughs> since the uh, statistics having been collected and we can monitor that that well-being but still it's only looking at averages and you can just see that the from the responses actually just in the chat about the the sort of average feeling of well-being in the country is a very limited you know expression of this huge range where some people are you know, so, you know let's all just go back to normal and sort of fine and, you know let's live our, get back and live our lives and other people are still clearly really really worried about this and very yeah. and, and actually as you say you know, kids aren't going to school people aren't going out people are very worried so i think that's why i i so welcome the um I mean, whether you consider that as part of leveling up or, or diversity or whatever, it doesn't matter from a statistical point of view, it's the fact that the variation is as important as the average. And the yeah. more that that, and, and in other words, people's individualized experience needs to be taken seriously and needs to be part of what is communicated and what's recognized. And we're still only just learning that. And I think everyone should demand in the sense that their experience is represented. It doesn't mean it has to be the dominant you know, narrative at all, but at least it should be represented, represented in that spread of a description of a society. I mean, yeah. so, um, I mean these are in a sense yeah. obvious, but actually it doesn't happen that much. Yeah. I think someone once said 20th century statistics was all about aggregates and averages and 21st century statistics is all about disaggregating and understanding difference and so like the national well-being being 7.2 doesn't tell you very much but knowing the differences by place age gender etc actually is very informative uh, marvin a final word to you before we close this session this is the wish list right you want yep all right so I'm on a 30 year plan to rebuild the UK cities. Um, I, I think that uh, we need to be very intentional about building cities that are inclusive um, and resilient and um, efficient. And you can't do that on the back of a fact packet. You can't do it on you know, a funding pot here and a funding pot there and Western is controlled. You have to have a coherent, predictable, uh, relevant uh, line of finance with co-written uh, plans with cities uh, that deliver that transformation and needs to be front loaded in the next uh, few years to meet our 2030 carbon targets. I think that fits with the challenges of the nation at the moment to have a world class, you know, world leading, global leading city in every uh, region. And it's the, I think it's the quickest way to reach the highest numbers of people. It cannot be politically led, this must be evidence and data led. So the fact that cities are labor led and all the core cities are labor led and Glasgow's SNP needs to be irrelevant, right? This is about delivering uh, for the UK. Um, and, and by the way, by the way, that's not about me being selfish on cities. That has to be built around an understanding of the role of cities today. Um, Andy made this point, uh, it, cities interact with towns and surrounding rural areas. Um, this has to be a physical rebuilding, but don't forget the need to invest in people. Um, on that point, just as a supplementary to that, I would just, the question I think would be good to explore with Andy, when is spending investment and not spending disinvestment? All right? not, all, not everything we do in public, uh, if I spend in public health, that's an investment in population resilience. Right? And an unresilient population is an expensive population, both in the face of crisis, but in terms of the future costs of adult social care and, and the NHS. And I think we need to be clear that local government isn't about all about spending. What I'm in the business of here is giving you the healthiest workforce in the future, uh, un unlocking skills that are too often less left undeveloped because we live in one of the most socially immobile countries in the OECD. 
Um, the third point I just make uh, on is a, a debate I think we need to have around this double devolution and I, the point. And I think we just have to be very careful that what is badged as devolution, whether it is. I'll give you an example. In Bristol, we have a charity called Empire Fighting Chance. The work has now gone national and global. It's amazing, it uses boxing around mental health. Empire will tell you when they, when they are offered money by the national government, they end up accountable to London, not to Bristol. Then what happens is there's a criteria under which that money was given to them. And that criteria stays in place for three years, even if the context in which they're working has changed. So they constantly have to tell the old story and they can't have a conversation. And that's not real devolution. The fullness of devolution has to be an investment in the governance in a place. And I don't mean local government. I mean, the way the collection of organizations in a place work together to shape the future um, of that place. And if that question of empowering local governance in the face of national government isn't addressed, then it will fall short, I think, of the full potential in, and intention of devolution. Thank you, Marvin. And thank you all, all our speakers for giving us such a fantastic sort of start to the day. So many issues to, to pick up on.